Well, hello everybody. Pastor Joel here with you one more time for the past days with Pastor Joel. Thought I'd do another car video here as sometimes I think of things while I'm driving along and I can get those thoughts out while they stay in my mind. And I just want to share uh, some thoughts with you. Um, many of you know my story. I've gotten to know some of your stories and just by way of reminder, I am going to be getting some of your stories out to others in our audience because I think you're going to be very encouraged by them. And if you have not yet sent in a couple or three paragraphs telling me your story about how you came to fulfill prophecy, uh, maybe you don't have that view of prophecy and that's okay too. Please share those. If you have no idea what I'm talking about, you may want to go back and watch a video that I titled, I Want to Hear From You. It's only about 10 minutes long and that'll give you some context for what I'm saying. But I wanted to share with you some things that I think you'll be able to resonate with and I'd love some comments to see sort of where you are um, in terms of what I'm talking about. But it has to do a little bit with, with being part of a church. I'm careful to say I could not say, rather, going to church because there really isn't such a thing if we understand uh, what the Ecclesia of God is. It's really not some place you can go. Uh, but anyway, maybe that's for another video. But being part of a church, what do we do as preterists? And, and one of the concerns I've had, and I'm not, I never step on people's toes on purpose. I never mean to offend, but, but some of us may step on some toes and it may offend. So just know that that's not my intent. These are questions I'm asking myself, To What do we do now with being part of a church? Can we be part of a church as preterists? And um, if you've been on some Facebook groups, then you've probably seen some of this too, but there are, are uh, some preterists, and I, and I get it, I get it, uh, just, just based on what they say and sort of the tone or tenor of what they say, they, they've been hurt by churches, so have many of you watching, um, so have I, uh, big time, still extremely painful, and uh, so we understand that. Uh, they've been called names, heretics, which is probably one of the nicer ones. Maybe you've been condemned to hell like I have, um, told you have a different Jesus, told you're part of a cult, um, you're part of the last day's apostasy. Uh, maybe you've been told you're influenced by, by demons. I've been told all of those things. Maybe you have too. Um, but what I wanted, I just, again, these are just some of my thoughts and, I, and hear them from the heart of a pastor because that's how they're intended. I, want, I don't want my heart to get hard. I don't want to get jaded. I don't want to be bitter. I don't want to be resentful. I don't want to see other people for whom Christ died as enemies, and, and something that has kind of bothered me that, I, that um, I'm afraid that I might have been potentially heading in that direction was to see futurists as my enemies. But we have to remember Christ loves the church. Christ died for the church. And I remember something that struck me many, many years ago, long before I came to an understanding of or embracing of fulfilled eschatology. Um, Acts, I believe it's chapter 9, where Paul has his Damascus Road conversion experience. And you know the story. He gets kicked off his horse, and he hears this voice, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting the church? It's not what he said, is it? Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Is what Jesus said. And I remember just seeing that and just being amazed at how unified Jesus saw he and his church, his, his bride, those for whom he died. I rhymed. Even, I didn't even try it. <laughs> I was kind of, it wasn't going to work. And then I cried. 
Um, at any rate, um, Jesus sees so much unity that, that when he sees his church being persecuted, he he feels that he senses that as if he himself is being persecuted. Now, I'm not for a moment, I'm not, please hear this, I'm not for a moment saying that I know of preterists that are persecuting other Christians. I know of a lot of preterists who have been persecuted by other Christians, and yours truly is one of them. And, I, and I'm careful that I don't, I don't just throw the word persecuted around. I'm talking about you know, something that at least seems like very real persecution. I know some of you personally have gone through that. Some of you have been kicked out of not just one church. I know of one person who's been kicked out of three. We should maybe see who's got the record. <laughs> Guinness Book of Preterist Records. <laughs> Who's been kicked out of the most churches? I, I don't know. But all that to say that we, we have to remember, I have to remember, that Jesus loves his church so much. And that would be those that sincerely belong to him, regardless of their beliefs on spiritual gifts and how they might function today, regardless of their beliefs on baptism, regardless of whether or not they hold to a young earth or old earth, view, regardless of whether they're Arminians or Calvinists, and regardless of their eschatology. Now, believe me, I see, and I know you do, you see as well, the importance of eschatology, and the more I've studied this, I've realized that eschatology touches virtually every other doctrine. It impacts all of Scripture, so I think it is extremely, extremely, extremely important. To be honest, I don't really even see it as a secondary issue. Uh, I, I love what um, uh, one of the books I read by Max King. I, I agree 100% with what he said. He said eschatology does affect salvation, but one's understanding of it doesn't. I think there he hit the nail on the head. It does affect salvation. And I'll maybe do a video on that. It has to do with Romans 9, 28. It does affect salvation. But our, whether or not we understand it properly doesn't, which means dispensationalists can be sincere believers. On mills, post mills, partial prats can all have salvation. Okay, so I, I see how important it is. But knowing how important it is doesn't mean that once we come to that understanding, then we become mean-spirited towards or resentful and bitter at other believers who don't hold that eschatology. And believe me, I, I know how frustrating it can be. I know how frustrating it can be when you, you can show them these texts and still some of them do this. La 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 They'll probably sing that well while they're doing it, but but you can get it. Stop up their ears, close their eyes, plug their noses. <laughs> but futurists are not our enemies. In fact, as believers, we should have no enemies. We might be someone's enemy. But we don't need to have any enemies. We're to live at peace with everyone as much as it is up to us. Sometimes we do all we can and others don't respond. And even then, and even if we feel like we do have some who might be our enemies, what do we do with our enemies as Christians? We love them. So with that in mind, I want to just make a suggestion. This is something that I'm trying to follow in my own life. And, and I'm someone who sometimes I try to come up with little phrases or sentences just because they they help me remember things, they help me focus on things. And we need as predators. Let me just let me just keep it to myself. Rather than reprimanding futurists for having what I consider and believe wholeheartedly to be the wrong understanding, a very wrong understanding, a very erroneous understanding in some ways an egregious misunderstanding because I do think that all futurism puts into question whether or not Jesus was who he said he was, whether or not the apostles were inspired, whether or not the scriptures inspired. I do think it's that important. I want you to hear that. But I need to move from an attitude, from an orientation of reprimanding futurists for believing the wrong thing and rather 
restoring what I like to call now the complete gospel. And there's a few other preterists that I talked to that use that same phraseology. In other words, let's let's see them as people not who need pity, like, oh, I'm so sorry for the wrong thing, but but who need to be taught and shown lovingly. You know, there, there's there's more to this gospel than you understand. Can I can I restore to you? Can I help you see the real, the full, the complete gospel of Jesus Christ? So to have compassion on them, uh, and most of whom I honestly believe are just sincere believers who have never been taught anything else. But they're following Jesus the best they can, and the reason they hold to the futurism, I want you to listen to this, the reason they hold to the futurism is the same reason we hold to preterism. They want to defend Jesus. Which, as believers, all of us should want to do. Because we believe the scriptures are true, and because from their perspective, it hasn't happened yet, and they believe that sincerely, like I did for some 27 years, they are saying, well, I know it's, I know we see these time texts, I know it says soon near at hand, right at the door, etc., but I just, I simply can't believe that, because if I believe that, then Jesus was wrong, and they don't want to be Jesus to be wrong any more than you and I want Jesus to be wrong as preterists. And so I'm going to go ahead and wrap this up, but I just want to suggest that, and, and, and you know, none of us would I don't think we'd do this on purpose, but if you're seeing your role as a preterist now, like like you're on a, a mission, you're waving the flag to reprimand and, and essentially spank futurists for believing the wrong thing. First of all, it's not Christ-like. Second of all, it's going to be very, very ineffective in terms of getting the preterist message as close as across the street and as far as across the world. That approach, we're going to, we're going to shoot ourselves in the foot. So let's instead, instead of thinking of our role, if it is for you, it has been for me sometimes, so to reprimand futures for believing the wrong thing, let's instead think of lovingly and compassionately restoring the completed gospel that Jesus and the apostles and the Old Testament prophets taught. And let's see it as an opportunity to show them, you know, you have so much more than you think, and you have it right now. You you have the presence of Christ right now. It's not an already and a not yet. You, you have the yet. You have everything. You have every spiritual blessing under heaven. You have complete salvation. Christ has completed everything. He has conquered death. So we can passionately share these things. Now, are they all going to buy it? No. Surprise, surprise. But that's okay. And then we keep going and we keep sharing. We stay on offense. We're not offensive. We stay on offense, why would we not with this incredible message? But I just, I think it's, if nothing else, maybe just a little shift in our psyche between reprimanding those for believing the wrong thing according to what we believe and rather um, restoring the complete gospel with love and compassion. So I'll, I'll leave this video there for now. I'm Pastor Joel saying bye for now.